All right. If you have your Bibles, we're going to continue to be in John 19. John 19 is where we're at this morning. We began this, uh, we looked at this passage last week, and we're going to continue to look at this passage again this morning. I want to read the text again. And as I read, would you just prayerfully listen and see our Savior as he is being crucified and the scene, just picture the scene around what's going on around Jesus as well. John 19, we're going to be at verses 16 down to verse 30. And so then, because of them, he handed them over to be crucified, and therefore they took Jesus away. Carrying his own cross by himself, he went out to a place, to what is called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign made and put on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Don't write the King of the Jews, but that he said that I am the King of the Jews. Pilate replied, What I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, they divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier, and they also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven, woven in one piece from the top, and they said to one another, let's not tear it, but let's cast lots for it to see who gets it. And this happened that the scriptures might be fulfilled, that says that they divided my clothes among themselves, and they cast lots for my clothing, and this is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour forward, the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. And so they filled a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. The gospel is good news. The gospel is an announcement that something has happened. It is news that changes everything. It changes the way you view the world. It changes the way you view your neighbors. It changes the way you view yourself. It is news that changes you from the inside out. It transforms you. It renews you. It converts you because not because it's good advice, but it's good news. It's not a curriculum of steps to follow. It is news of something that has already been accomplished for you. The Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, doesn't begin like the way we think it would begin. It doesn't start off with the words, in a galaxy far, far away, there was God. Right? It doesn't begin with the words, once upon a time, there was little baby Jesus. It doesn't say... Here are 10 steps or 10 things that you need to do to remedy for the sins that you've done so that you can have a place in heaven. It doesn't read like an instruction manual, but it's almost like a news story. It's just a list of names. Matthew 1 is just a list of names. And if you go through this list, you discover that it's a list of names of broken, messed up, jacked up, sinful people. Why? Because it's telling you of something that happened for you, not instructions to tell you what you ought to do. And it's absolutely vital, friends, that you understand this, or you will end up missing the entire point of Scripture. So here's the good news, and you've heard me say this so many times, that Jesus lived a life that you and I could not live. He died the death that you and I should have died to save us, to rescue us. Rescue us from what? Rescue us from our sins. Rescue us from ourselves. Rescue us from our eternal death sentence. And that, friends, changes, that news changes everything. 
and central to Jesus' life and mission on this earth was not a sermon that he preached or a parable that he taught or an act of kindness or even a miracle, but central to the life and mission of Jesus was a cross. A bloody, gruesome, ugly, messy cross. A execution devised by the Romans to terminate people who stood in opposition to them. And Jesus, all throughout his earthly life, would talk about the cross. It was told to us that before Jesus even came, that this is what he was called for, to die for us. It was the cross that him and the Father, in an eternity past, determined that he would bear for the sins of the world. And so we come again this morning to the cross, the culmination of Jesus' mission on this earth, the central object in the gospel story. We've seen last week how Jesus suffered so that you and I would be free. We saw how he was mocked so that you and I would be loved. And today, we finish looking at the cross and how Jesus bore all that we deserved. We get his life and righteousness, not only get his life and righteousness, but we get joy and peace and satisfaction. But we get that because Jesus got our life and our unrighteousness. It was an unfair a glorious exchange. Four more things I want to look at this morning, and I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, but I'll be honest. Each of these should cause us to pause and worship Jesus. Each of these, if we had time, would be a sermon in and of itself because there's so much to be said of each of these topics, but I'm going to try to run through them this morning. Number one, number three, actually. Number one, he, was, he suffered so that we could be free. Number two, he was mocked so that we could be loved. Number three, he was exposed so that we might be clothed. He was exposed so that we might be clothed. Look at verse 23. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took this tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top, and they said to one another, let's not tear this, but toss for it to see who get this. They did this to fulfill the scriptures that say they divided my clothes among themselves, and they cast lots from my clothing, and this is what the soldiers did. As Jesus is suffering immensely, the soldiers are still going at it. Jesus would have been on the cross with just a loincloth to cover him. And the soldiers take his clothing, what little he had as a homeless man, and divided it among the four of them. See, this was the right of the soldiers, and it was part of their pay for the work that they did. Every Jewish man back then wore five articles of clothing. There was a sandal, turban, a, a turban or a hat, a belt, a tunic, or, and an outer robe. One of the soldiers would get his sandals, one would get his robe, one would get his belt, one would get his tunic. And there was one item left that was not chosen. It was the tunic, a shirt that was worn next to the skin, like an inner undergarment or something. And it's reasonable to understand why no one wanted it because... It was smelly, it was dirty, it was ugly. And because, Scripture says, it was sewn together, the one whole garment, they realized it would be pointless for them to tear it apart. And so they began to cast lots. And as we said last week, at the crucifixion, you see all sorts of Old Testament prophecies coming to fruition. And here's another one coming to be fulfilled. Psalm 22 says that they divided my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. Jesus is just at the crucifixion, one prophecy after another from the Old Testament is becoming fulfilled. And so Jesus dies naked. Why would that be such a travesty? Nakedness refers to defenselessness, to vulnerability. To be naked is to have a no defense against people and people will be able to see you completely. You have nothing to hide yourself from public view. You're laid out there bare, open, exposed. Back before the fall in the Garden of Eden, nakedness wasn't a problem. Adam and Eve were naked in the garden. They were unashamed. They had nothing to hide. They weren't afraid of being rejected. Fear, rejection, shame, that didn't exist in the garden. But when they turned from God and they began to sin, they saw this need to cover up because they had something to hide. They experienced shame for the first time. So they began to sew clothings for themselves out of fig leaves. 
They were propelled by inner shame to cover up outwardly. And friends, all of us have something to hide today. Each of us this morning have our own proverbial fig leaves and we're trying to cover up our moral deficiencies. Something we, feel like we, something we feel like we would melt if the world knew about us. You all sense this, whether you believe in Jesus or not. Think about it. Why are you so obsessed with the way you look? Why are you so consumed with making a name for yourself? Why do you care if people look at you and approve of you, accept you, or like you? Why do you care whether you are successful or not? Why do you try with everything that is in you to look good and save face with people, many people whom you don't even like, and you want to look good in front of them? But yet, when you come alone and you're by yourself, all of a sudden your true self comes out, you left your guard down. These mechanisms of cover-up are all fig leaves that we're covering up who we really are. You have to cover up because people, you don't want people to see the real you. You don't want people to see how much you struggle or what you go through. Why? Because you feel like if they really knew you, you'd be rejected. Your identity is wrapped up in being accepted and approved by others. But when you look at the cross, you see Jesus who was stripped of everything so that you and I could be clothed. Clothed with what? With his salvation, with his righteousness, with his beauty. He took our shame by being completely vulnerable and exposed for us. Isaiah 61 says it this way, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God because he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom that decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress as a bride that adorns herself with her jewels. Do you not know that the gospel, Jesus has clothed you and covered your shame and your rejection. He sees you as a bride on her wedding day. And this is the reason why he compares us as the church to his bride in Ephesians. Let me read you a passage from an Old Testament, a vision that Zechariah the prophet had. And read this. Listen to this. Zechariah the prophet is having this vision in Zechariah 3 and he said, he showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Satan, may the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick snatched from fire? Verse 3 says, Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And so the angel of the Lord spoke to those standing before him. Take off his filthy clothes. And he said to him, See, I've removed your iniquity from you. I will clothe you with festive clothes. Then I said, Let them put on a clean turban on his head. So a clean turban was placed on his head, and they clothed him in a garment while the angels of the Lord who stood by. Here's this picture of Jesus, the angel of the Lord, rebuking Satan. Satan is there accusing Joshua left and right. You're a sinner. You're messed up. You did this. You did that. You don't have no right to be here. And he takes Joshua's sins. Jesus takes Joshua's sins and he says, listen, your filthy garments, I'm removing them from you. I'm putting on a new beautiful garment and you're going to look completely different. You're now royalty, Joshua. And friends, that is exactly what Jesus did for you and I when we come to him by faith and repentance. You see, when Jesus lost his physical clothes on the cross, it was a picture of how he lost everything so that you and I could be clothed with everything. In many ways, he took our filthy garments and we got his beautiful garments. And now when the Father looks at you and I, he doesn't see you and all of your filth and all of your mess and all of your sins, but he sees Jesus. He bore your eternal shame on the cross so that you could be perfect and spotless before the Father. Some of you this morning feel dirty because of your past, but you need to know the truth that you are clean in Jesus. You are forgiven in Jesus. A modern day par parable, and I don't know if it's true or not, so I'm going to just call it a parable that really has impacted the way I do ministry and how I care for people was a story about a young lady who came into a service one day, encounters Jesus, and 
the Holy Spirit begins to change her life, convicting her of her sins. And this young woman had a very rough past before coming to Jesus, one that involved alcohol abuse, drug abuse, prostitution. But the truth of the gospel changed her life, and the change was evident to everyone around her. And as time wore on, she was discipled and became a faithful disciple of the church. And she started getting involved in different ministries, including teaching children the Bible. And it wasn't long before this young woman caught the eye of the son of the pastor. And they began this relationship, and their relationship became serious, and eventually they became, began making wedding plans. And that is when all the problems began to arise. Many in the church were great with her coming to church, but many were not great with her marrying the son of the pastor because the, she did not have a good past and was not worthy to be the pastor's son's wife. And the division became so heated that there was a meeting that was called to discuss the issue. The pastor was there, the son was there, the fiancé was there, and the meeting began to get really, really ugly, and people began to bring up all of the ugliness and the mess of her past for the entire church to hear. And eventually the pastor's son got up and began to speak, and this was his statement. He said, hey, listen, friends, my fiancé's past isn't on trial here this morning. What's on trial is whether the blood of Jesus truly does have the power to wash away our sins and cover our shame. This morning, we have put the cross of Jesus on trial. Does it wash away sin and forgive this person completely and make them brand new, or does it not wash away sin? Friends, when the enemy comes to you and begins to accuse you of your sin and remind you of your guilt and pulls you down because of your shame, you need to preach this truth to yourself over and over and over again. Jesus was exposed so that you and I could be covered. Jesus was stripped naked so that you and I can wear clothes of beauty and majesty and royalty. Jesus was left naked so that we are now the righteous children of God. I remember one lady being told by her mother before her wedding day that she shouldn't be able to wear a white wedding dress because she wasn't pure and because she sinned greatly before Jesus, before coming. And I remember the husband telling her that before God she's pure because of Jesus and one day she will stand before Jesus and at the marriage supper of the Lamb will be decked out in the purest, whitest gown that the world will ever see. Your past doesn't define you. If you are in Jesus, what you have gone through, what you've experienced, Jesus says, I have washed it, I have forgotten it, and I have thrown it to the deepest ends of the ocean. You, It is not something I will ever bring up. And friends, if God, the ultimate judge of the world, will not bring it up again, why do you still hold on to it? Why do you still cling on to it? Why do you let it pull you down from being what God has called you to be? God has seen everything about you, and friends, he still loves you. Think about that for a moment. This is what changes you. You won't try to be clothed by other things in this world by like fame or approval or acceptance or pleasures or accolades or money when you understand that Jesus has loved you and accepted you and you don't have to prove yourself to anyone because the one whose opinion matters looks down on you and he says I love you I accept you I call you my own I call you blessed I call you highly favored I call you forgiven and you can say with the psalmist in Psalm 23, Whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. And then you can echo the song, Give me Jesus, and say, From the bottom of your soul in the morning when I rise, Give me Jesus. When I'm alone, give me Jesus. When I come to die, give me Jesus. You can have all this world just give me Jesus. Number four, he was rejected that we might be reconciled, that we might be welcomed. He was rejected that we might be welcomed. Look at verse 25. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clophas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. 
And from that hour on, the disciples took her into his home. For the first time since Jesus was arrested, we see his disciples slowly trickling back, coming back. They had all abandoned him, but now here at the foot of the cross, we see his mother, his aunt, and two ladies named Mary together with John, the beloved disciple. It's mostly women, which again speaks to Jesus' countercultural uplifting and valuing of women in that day and age. And no doubt the soldiers were mocking these women and John for, the, for, G, for loving Jesus when he was being crucified, but they didn't care. They were unafraid of the consequences of aligning themselves with someone who was being crucified. We see Jesus' mother here first. No doubt she is remembering the time when Simeon showed up at the temple and told her that this would happen to Jesus as a little boy. He told her that a sword would pierce her side. And this was what was happening right now. She knew that Jesus was innocent. She raised him and he never did anything wrong toward her. He was the perfect son. And she knew that he was the son of God. What sorrow it must have caused her when there was no room at the inn that she had to lay her newly born baby in a manger. What anguish must have been there when she learned of Herod's desire to destroy her infant's life? What trouble must have been given to her when she was forced on the account of her son to flee her hometown and become a refugee in Egypt? What piercings of her soul must have been there when she saw her son despised, rejected by men? What grief must have wrung her heart when she beheld him hated and persecuted by his own people? And who can wonder and estimate, estimate what she was going through there, seeing her son die on the cross? Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. But we also see her sister, whose name was Salome. She was the mother of James and John. The only account we have of this woman was when she came to Jesus one day and said, Hey, listen, my two boys, I want you to make them your right-hand people in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus rebukes Salome. And she receives it well and follows Jesus all the way to the cross. And then we see this other woman by the name Mary Magdalene. This woman had seven demons inside of her that were cast out by Jesus. She was the one that we learned about a few months ago, the one who watered Jesus' feet with her tears, wiped, wiped it with her hair, and anointed the feet of Jesus with perfume. These are women that were broken and yet drawn into the love of Jesus. One had lost her husband and was about to lose her son. One was confronted and rebuked by Jesus for her political ambitions. One was formerly possessed by demons. And yet, here they are all at the foot of the cross in front of Jesus. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says something startling. He tells Mary that John is now her son. And he looks at John and says, Listen, this is now your mother. And I think... This is more than Jesus just making sure that his mother is taken care of. After all, Mary has lost her husband. Joseph died um, probably when Jesus was very young. But I think Jesus was showing them that as he was dying on the cross, something more here. I think he was bringing them and saying, Now listen, because I've died, you are now all part of one family. You're one family, the family of God. He was changing their relationship here. In bringing them to the Father through dying on their sins, he was now saying, listen, you are now brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. You are now going to start living out as the family of God. And this is exactly what Jesus promised in his teachings. In Mark 2, when Jesus was teaching, listening, uh, the crowds were listening. They said to him, listen, your mothers and your brothers are outside seeking you. And Jesus turned to them and said, who's my mother and who's my brother's? And looking around at those who sat around him, he said, These are my mothers, and these are my brothers, and these is my family. In Mark 10, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, there is not one who has left his house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or land for my sake, and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold for now in this time, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. And you take the story and you flip over a few pages to Acts chapter 1, just a couple pages over. You find 120 disciples gathered together in an upper room. Guess who's there? Acts 1 says it this way. They got 
together and they went up to the upper room and where they were staying, Peter was there, John was there, James was there, Andrew was there, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simeon the zealot, Judas the son of James, all of these were one accord devoting themselves to prayer together with the woman and Mary and the brothers of Jesus. They were all there. As a result of Jesus being rejected, you and I are now brought into the family of God. This is a new society, which is not segregated by race or gender or nationality. Social standing or economic standing doesn't matter in this family. And the way Jesus does this actually goes both against Western worldviews of family and Eastern worldviews of family. The Western worldview of family is that it's more about the individual than it's about the family. And Jesus made sure that we understood that we were supposed to take care of our family. As the oldest brother, Jesus would be the one responsible to take care of his mother, and he does there on the cross. But in the way that he takes care of his mom, goes against the Eastern worldview of family as well. The Eastern worldview of family is that family is everything. But Jesus goes against that. How? Remember, he had other brothers to take care of his mother, which have been would have been culturally how his mother should have been taken care of. But they didn't believe in him. And so he gives his mother to the spiritual family represented here by John. Jesus is not uplifting the individualism of Western culture or the family prominence of the Eastern culture. He's saying, listen, you have a responsibility to take care of your physical family and yet a priority of being an active participant in your spiritual family. You've got to be doing both. Jesus died not just to place you in a spiritual family of a local church, but to make you an active part of that family. So can I ask, what are you doing as a spiritual family of God? Are you connected? Are you plugged in? Are you known and being known by others? Jesus hung on that cross not just so that you could take up space on a row here, but you could be devoted to one another so that ultimately your love for one another would spill out into the world so that the world would know that you are his followers by your love for one another. Are you connected? Number five, Jesus thirsts so that we might be satisfied. Jesus thirsts so that we might be satisfied. Verse 28, after this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. And so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on hyssop and held it to his mouth. And Jesus now utters his second of three sayings in the Gospel of John about the cross. There were seven sayings that Jesus said, but this is the second one here in John. And Jesus again spoke to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. And we find that in the Psalms. Psalm 69 says, They gave me poison for food. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Psalm 22 says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. The fulfillment again of Scripture being fulfilled over and over. You see it here. But this was the secret of his strength. Jesus didn't cheat by relying on the fact that he was God. He wasn't tapping into his deity in this moment to deal with the suffering and pretend he was suffering. He used scriptures to tap into his strength. Even when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, what did he say? He said, it's written, it's written, it's written. He was constantly quoting scripture. It just poured out of him. That was his defense against the attacks of the enemy. Medically, at this point, his tongue would have been so swollen. And experts say that dying of thirst is like a fire that's burning in your throat. And so the people took a sponge that's soaked in sour wine, placed it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus. And maybe you've read this passage and you're like, oh wow, these people are having compassion on Jesus. But that's the furthest from the case. The sponge that's used here, commentators say, was most likely used as toilet paper in that time. So they basically took dirty toilet paper, wrapped it on a stick, and shoved it in the face of Jesus. They weren't having sympathy on Jesus. They were mocking him. But you've got to think about this. Up to this point, Jesus has never complained. When he was beaten, he never said a word. When they put a crown of thorns on his head, 
He never raised his voice. When they lied about him, he never said anything until now. Why? Why? Because I think something more than just physical thirst is going on here. The spiritual thirst is when God is not the center of your life. And that's exactly what's going on here with Jesus right now. Some of you guys are experiencing spiritual thirst because God is far from being the center of your life. You're pursuing your own dreams and ambitions. But why is Jesus thirsting spiritually? Because in this moment, Jesus is becoming sin for us. And the Father is turning his back on his Son. He is thirsting so that you and I can have the springs of eternal water that Jesus talked about in John 4. He is losing his relationship with the Father so that you and I could have a relationship with the Father. He is being cast out from the Father's presence so that you and I could be brought into the Father's presence. Listen, you and I deserve to be eternally separated from the Father and suffer spiritual thirst forever. You and I were made to be satisfied with God, and yet we try to fill our souls with everyone, everything else. We're the ones drinking in sour wine from a toilet sponge, and the result is that we thirst. Hell is really God giving us what we constantly strive after, a life separated from God. And thus forever we seek but never find. We pursue, but never grasp. We drink, but we're never satisfied because we try to do this all apart from God. But the good news is that you don't have to be that case because Jesus thirsted for you. He was separated for us from God so that we could be brought near. This is why Jesus would quote Psalm 22 again as he died. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night. But I find no rest. Jesus frantically lifts his eyes to the skies, to the Father who has gladly spoken to him all through his earthly life, every single time when he called. But this time he looks up and the Father isn't there. Where are you? Where are you when I need you? Don't leave me. And for the first time, and for the last time, when Jesus spoke, absolutely nothing happened. For the first time and for the last time when Jesus spoke, the Father didn't respond. Just a horrible, deadly silence. The Father didn't answer. He turned his face from his Son, and Jesus was left all alone, abandoned, left for dead. Remember, Jesus had caught a whiff of this in the Garden of Gethsemane, and this is why he's coming apart at the seams and sweating drops of blood and asking for this cup to pass. He's saying, God, if there's any other way for us to do this, let's do it another way. This is the cup that he had to drink if you and I are going to be satisfied with the presence of God forever. It was the only way of killing sin without killing us in the process. And now, as a result of Jesus being thirsty, you will be eternally satisfied with God by faith in him. Psalm 22 says it this way, the afflicted, the afflicted, the sinful shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise God. Isaiah says it this way, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine, buy milk, without money, without price. Revelation says it this way, the spirit and the bride says, come and let him who hears come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires water of life come without price. Jesus thirsted that you and I could be satisfied. Number six, he endured that we might be forgiven. He endured that we might be forgiven. Verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. After Jesus took a drink from the sponge, he cried out, it is finished. What was finished? The mission to seek and save the lost. He had accomplished that which mankind could not do for himself, atone for our sins. He accomplished for creation what it could not do for itself, certainty that the curse of sin was removed and that one day there would be a new heaven and a new earth. 
It took a sinless man to do this, and that kind of man did not exist on the earth, and so God himself became man in order to bring sinful man back to God himself. Jesus ended not with a shout of saying, I'm done, but he ended with a shout of triumph, saying, what, I, what you have sent me to this earth, I have accomplished, it is finished. This is a victorious cry. Jesus, John records that Jesus said it is finished. It is one word in the Greek. Jesus doesn't say, I quit. He doesn't say, I give up. He doesn't say, I'm signing off. But rather, he says, it is finished. Victory is accomplished. These are words of victory, not words of resignation. It's interesting that the last words of Buddha were, keep striving. The last words of Jesus was, it is finished. One is religion. The other is gospel. One is instruction. The other is news. One is something that you need to do. The other is something that has been done for you. One is filled with insecurity and hopelessness. The other is filled with power and certainty. One is bad news. The other is good news. We now strive to live for Jesus because he strived for us. We love because he first loved us. We don't add to our, his work. We work because of his work. See, you and I, we can so easily slip into this religious mindset thinking that we need to make up for things that we've done wrong. We need to somehow try and appease God by some way really digging into our Bibles or really praying or really going on a good stretch of regular church attendance. All the while, we're standing there with this list of activities saying, let me finish while you started. And Jesus is saying, it's finished. It's finished. There's not a thing that you can do to make God love you more there's not a thing that you could do to make God love you less. It's finished. Galatians 2 says it this way, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me in the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't nullify the grace of God, for if my righteousness were through the law, then Christ would have died with no purpose. Listen, we who are in Christ, we have been crucified with Jesus. Four things were nailed to that cross. Jesus was nailed to that cross. A sign above his head was nailed to that cross. The depth of our, the debt of our sin was nailed. And if you are a Christian here this morning, you were nailed to that cross as well. Everything about you, all your sin, all your scars, all your supposed goodness, all the sins committed against you and the sins that you've committed against others, Every sin, past, present, and future, everything you will ever do was nailed to that cross. Your lust, your adultery, your hatred, your murder, your self-righteousness, your pride, your anger, all of your despicable, despicable good works were nailed there too. And the things that you try to appease God with was nailed there too. See, this is another way of God saying to us that he cast our sin into the deepest of the oceans, placed it behind his back, and removed it as far as the east is from the west. God saw you on that cross 2,000 years ago, so that when Jesus said on that cross, it is finished, he said that for you as well. If the world were set up where we could wash away our own sins, if it was remotely possible that eternal joy could be found outside of Jesus, if eternal satisfaction could be tasted outside of our Savior, if forgiveness could ever be earned in a slightest way apart from Jesus, if our identity could be placed in anything other than Jesus and make us whole, then why would Jesus have to die? Then why would Jesus have to die? Jesus' death would have been just plain dumb. And listen, I'm not talking to unbelievers this morning. I'm talking to believers. If you persist in building up the wall that Jesus tore down, if you try to climb up to God's favor some other way apart from Jesus, if you try to add works to the law or even by your own penance and wallowing in guilt to, sacrifice, to, in the, to the sacrifice of the cross, then you are making a mockery of Jesus' death, and just as the soldiers who spat on him and the thieves who hurled insults on him and the mob who shouted, come down from the cross, friends, it is finished. It's finished. Romans 8, now there is therefore no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. 
There's no condemnation. When we fail to believe that it is finished, when we fail to believe that there is truly no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus, and we feel like we have to show God how serious we are and try to prove our worth and value after some significant moral failure, it's like we're walking all over the cross and saying, Jesus, your death is great, but I still have to do some work to get this sin off of me. Jesus, you don't know how bad I am. Can you hear the words of Jesus this morning? It is finished. It is finished. Jesus will do everything for you, or he'll do nothing for you. If justification was even in the slightest measure through our human effort, then friends, Jesus died in vain. All of this is pointless. Jesus didn't die to help you. He died to save you. He didn't die to take you halfway to heaven and say, all right, now you finish the rest somehow. Make it up to me. He didn't die to forgive the sins that you committed before you came to Jesus and then say, all right, every time you sin from now on, you've got to make it up. He died for all of your sin, past sins, present sins, future sins. Friends, it is finished. Either that's a true truth or that's a lie. And you will know whether you believe that based on how you come to Jesus. Do you come to Jesus wallowing in guilt over what you've done? Or do you come to Jesus knowing that Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus, I can come freely into the throne room of grace, knowing that I am loved and accepted and forgiven, knowing that when Jesus died on the cross, it is finished. My past sins are forgiven. My present sins are forgiven. My future sins are forgiven. It is finished. And Jesus doesn't leave you with the option to say, wow, cool story, that's cool, that's nice, I feel inspired this morning when I leave here. His death is either the most ridiculous event in the history of the world, or it is the most outstanding act of love the world has ever seen. What is it to you? You must either laugh and mock him, or you must bow at his feet and worship and adore him. As we go to communion this morning, Would you reflect on how you are clothed in Christ? If you're here with guilt and shame, would you come to Jesus and lay all of your guilt and shame on Jesus' bruised and bloodied shoulders? Would you reflect on the fact that God has called you into a spiritual family because of Jesus' death? If you're sitting on the sidelines this morning and just attending, and not engage, would you recommit to love the local church that Jesus died for? We're messy. So are you. We don't have our act together. Neither do you. And this is why we need each other. Would you commit to being engaged? Would you commit to being involved? Would you commit to saying, I'm going to be more than just someone who attends on a Sunday, but I am going to be family. I'm going to play my role in the family of God. Would you reflect on the eternal living water Jesus has given you because he was separated for you? How he bore hell for you so you and I would never have to bear hell. And finally, would you reflect on how Jesus endured till the very end and he boldly proclaimed it is finished. Would you confess your lack of faith in that promise And would that push you into the unconditional love of God for you in Christ Jesus? This morning, if you need prayer, there's going to be people in the back available to pray with you in the back of the sanctuary if you're needing prayer. Whether it's something related to this morning's sermon or if it's something that you just want someone to pray with, can I invite you to sneak back there before or after you take communion? And would you just pray with someone this morning? This morning as we come to the cross and as we prepare this week for Passion Week and we look at Easter and Good Friday and everything that's going on as we remember the greatest event in the history of the world, would you just meditate on all that Jesus did so that you could be here this morning forgiven, accepted? Would you pray with me, our Father? We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he suffered in immense ways 
so that we could be free. That we could find our freedom in you. That the power and the bondage of sin has been broken. The devil has no claim on us. That we are tightly clenched in the arms of Jesus and no Satan or in this world could ever pull us away from you. Father, we thank you that Jesus was mocked so that we could be loved. That he experienced all of the ridicule and the mockery and the jesting and all of that on the cross. That you look down on us and you say, well done good and faithful servant. You don't mock us for our failures. You don't ridicule us for our sins. You, all of that has been washed away by the blood of Jesus and we are loved this morning. We thank you that Jesus was exposed, laid naked on the cross so that our shame has been covered. Our guilt has been removed. We We've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. We thank you that he was rejected so that we could be welcomed. We thank you that he endured thirst and he experienced spiritual thirst where the Father turned his back on him so that we could be fully satisfied both here on this earth and forevermore. And we thank you that Jesus endured till the end, that he finished what he started, he accomplished what he came to this earth for, that he was boldly and able to proclaim it is finished, it is done, so that this morning we are forgiven. Father, we hear this story so often and it's become a back burner to us as just part of the Christian story, but I pray that the gospel would be so fresh this morning, that the cross would be the center of our hearts and our lives, that we would realize the significance of the cross and the meaning it has for our lives. Father, as we come to this table, we recognize the only reason we can come to this table is because of Jesus. So we give you our worship, our praise, our adoration. We love you in Jesus' name.